care of the most important things. I uh, have a special message today uh, for the graduates, for all of us, but a charge to the graduates. Uh, I'll do something a little different today by turning to a little known book in the Old Testament <laughs> on Exodus. So I'm going to ask you to make your way to Exodus chapter 21. Some of these graduates are thinking my entire high school career we've been in Exodus. <laughs> And I know that you have greatly enjoyed your time there because you tell me all the time, when are we going to be done? As if in anticipation of climax of the study of Exodus. So uh, you'll make your way to Exodus chapter 21. I want to get straight away into it. In, in February of 2018, we began this journey. In February of this year, we extended our study of Exodus by taking a more detailed look into the Ten Commandments. We, we journeyed through them asking what they are, who's being targeted with them, are they still even applicable for us today, is this something that we still need to obey, is the things that we still need to follow. And we have to remember some essential details in our study before we get into our text today in Exodus 19. We learned that we cannot divorce the law giving from the narrative in which it originates because the storyline brought Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness to the foot of this mountain that is now quaking and shaking and is on fire. If nothing else, the majesty and transcendence of a holy God is on full display on this mountain. And the people are a little freaked out about this. This is the God that they've heard about, but the God that they've not yet met. This is the God that they've only heard about in story. And now that they're meeting Him face to face on this mountain with all the, the quaking and the shaking and the smoking and the furnace of fire that, is, uh, that has lit the mountaintop, uh, they're a little unnerved. And if that wasn't enough, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1, it says these words, Then God spoke. Then God spoke. Not that they or we deserve this special favor, but according to the kind and intention of His will, God says, This is who I am. This is what I want for you. And so in Exodus chapter 20, we begin a slow journey through these Ten Commandments. Can anybody remember the first one? You shall have what? No other gods before me. That's right. The second is like unto that. You shall not make what? No graven images. No idols. We learned in the third commandment not to take whose name in vain? God's name in vain. To remember a day, to set aside a day, to keep holy for the day, to honor our parents, to not engage in murder or the taking of innocent life, to not commit adultery, to not stealing, to not bearing false witness or lying to God or ourselves or each other, and then ultimately, do not covet. And so we've, we've made our way through these commandments, and in the commandments, we, we've noticed a, a, a logical division in the commandments. The first four, and this is your first fill in the blank today, it has everything to do with your relationship to God. And these are the first four because they're the most important in, in, in essence in how we deal with God, this vertical relationship with God. Because how can we have a relationship to each other, these last six commandments, if at first our relationship with God is not pure and right? In the delivery of the law, God established a people for Himself. He establishes a people for Himself. He equipped them with the knowledge of who He is by just in the words that He's speaking. And then thirdly, ex expectations for how He wants them to behave and what He wants them to do. In Exodus chapter 20, and verse 18, it says, The people saw it, they trembled, and they stood in the distance saying, Let not God speak to us, or we will die. This is the God that desires a close intimate relationship with you and they're saying we don't want to see we, we want to stand at a distance we're afraid and please Moses you just tell us what God wants for us but 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 this relationship between us and him I, I'm not so sure about that it's a far cry from Exodus or from Exodus 19 before the mountain of God was on fire and they heard some words of the Lord and they said all that the Lord has spoken 
We'll do it. Right. All that God said we will do. It's easy on this day, on this graduation day, to say, yes, whatever the Lord said, whatever He speaks to His servants, whatever charge we get, man, I'm going to march right into that school, and I'm going to be a man or a woman for God. I'm going to march right into the workplace, and I'm going to do all that God said. And then there's that pretty little girl who walks around. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. We'll follow her. And then there's the crowd that begins to say, hey, you want to go out with us? You want to come do with us? Come experience life with us. <clears throat> Wait a minute. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. What just happened there, right? The distance between Exodus 19 and Exodus 20 is about a day. The distance that you're going to have throughout the summer, you're going to have plenty of time to try to figure out what kind of man or woman you're going to be when you're on your own. Some of you will stay close by, and some of you will be down the road just a little bit. But what kind of man and woman are you going to be? All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's easy to preach, but hard to live. Hard to live. Good, you listen just a little bit. <laughs> At the conclusion of God's speaking, these ten commandments to His people, God begins to expand on them and expound a little bit more with many and various applications of daily life. And this is where people really want the meat of the word to come true to them, right? I hear the Ten Commandments, do not murder. Well, that's easy. I've not murdered anyone. Okay, I'm not even old enough. I haven't, I've never been married, so committing adultery is not really for me. What are they? The daily things. What are the, the how-tos? What are the to-do list in the Scriptures that I can come to next? And in uh, this next section of Scripture, Israel calls this the Mishpatim. The Mishpatim, which means Book of the Covenant. And then here in this next section, we also are called, maybe in your subtitles in your scripture, they're called sundry laws. Have you ever heard this term sundry before? It means many or various. And so there are various types of legislation that God is giving to His people. In these sundry laws, we find the consistency that we've seen in, in the Ten Commandments and that we are to love God and to love each other, have a relationship with God, have a relationship with each other. But as we know, loving our neighbor is not always as easy as it sounds. Can I get a witness in the house today? Loving our neighbor is not as always as easy as it sounds. You take away all your creature comforts, you take away all your privacy fences and your brick walls and your house and the closeness of, of just your family unit that's inside there. You take all that away, you throw yourself in the middle of the desert with two million people, and then all of a sudden a few little helpful guidelines might prove helpful. Right? They should. They should. And that's what Exodus 21 through 24 are all about. If you'd like to shake somebody's hand or hug somebody's neck today, I encourage you to do that with Billy Fuquay and Russell Hamath because I have considered, I have considered reading this whole text to you and uh, they intervened on your behalf and so you can be thankful to them as you go along. They are meant to be guidelines. They're meant to be uh, helpful for us to, 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 to look at, to listen to, for judges to discern and apply, but they cannot possibly uh, attend to every single situation, every single circumstance. I, I would like in the next few chapters to what you might experience in college in Sociology 101. You might have to take this class in college. And what you're going to learn in Sociology 101 is how to establish a norm for people or how to promote the general welfare of a society. That's what sociology does. It's been a few years since I've taken sociology as a junior in high school, and those were the things that they taught me. That's the only thing I remember about that class, except for the fact that the football coach taught it, and when the football coach was busy, none of us had to go to class, which he wasn't my favorite teacher. So, Sociology 101 is to establish a norm and promote the general welfare of society. These next two chapters do that very thing. Now, these high school graduates that we have are about to find out very soon when you go live in a dorm with a complete stranger with completely different views on religion, politics, cleanliness, and personal hygiene, you're going to find out very quickly the proximity of living together with someone changes the whole game in the relationship and how to love one another. One author said this, though, the law is powerless to change human nature on its own. It can only protect life and property by regulating human behavior. Telling us that we all need the law. 
The enforcing of good laws doesn't guarantee a perfect society, but it does promote order and prevent anarchy, and boy, do we need that in our land today. This next section of scripture is mocked by the atheists and overanalyzed by the liberal theologians, but mostly what unnerves me is it is ignored by Christians. And we do so at our own peril. Why? Because it's too tedious. It's too boring. It's too antiquated. It's too mundane. Yeah, most people, when they uh, come to know the Lord and they pick up a Bible, they buy a new Bible, it's like, okay, I'm going to commit to reading this thing. I want to find out who the Lord is. And man, all it, it's all really interesting until you get to Exodus chapter 21. And then it comes to a screeching halt with all these laws and regulations. And so what do we do? We get bored. We turn the page looking for another story that's going to entertain we look forward to another part of Scripture that's just going to be a little bit easier to understand or ascertain. And so we get to this point, but I want to, I want to caution you with this today because there should be a huge reminder for us today as we turn the page into this section of Scripture. And I want to point out to you that this is Exodus 21, 22, 23, and 24. It's just as inspired. It's just as God breathed. It's just as holy and profitable for us as John 3.16. So please do not just look at it and go, man, that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to move on to the next thing. I know I'm a little weirder probably than most of you. These sections of Scripture tend to make my mind race and I get a little bit more uh, excited when I get to things like this because I want to know what it means. I want to know what it's there for. So we're not going to read it all today. <laughs> we're not going to dive too deep into these murky waters of these laws. But So the message is going to be a little less expositional in that, a little bit more topical in nature as we uh, finish our time together. But there is something inside of these chapters that's worthy for us to study. Something, some information that we need to pull out, something that we can learn about God that is the theology of the things and how we wrestle with theology, what we can learn about God, and then what points us to Christ. This has been our, our theme since we began, the theology and the Christology. What can we learn about God and what points us to Christ? So what kinds of laws are these sundry laws? Anyway? What, what is the purpose of them before we even read some of them? Before we get to that, we've got to understand the context of this is for a specific, particular people at a particular place in a particular time for a particular purpose. That's what context is all about. So when we're reading about this, we have to understand that God's moral law, these great Ten Commandments that we see, is for everybody, every time, and every place. It's for every civilization not to take it in sin life. It's for every situation to contain the family unit together by not committing adultery, not stealing, and not coveting. That's for everyone. But these laws, these guidelines are, are ceremonial, civil law for Israel. So what can we learn from that? God's preparing His people for something specific. I've got three things for you. God's preparing for His people for, for one, life after Egypt. Right? Because they've been taken, they've learned from all these other religions, they've learned from all these other practices. God is laid, now laying down these laws of the Ten Commandments and these subsequent sundry laws afterwards to say, you're going to be a different type of people than you were then. So first, life after Egypt. Second, that there's going to be 40 years of wilderness existence. He's preparing them for 40 years to live in this wilderness. Interestingly enough, all but two of these two million people are going to really experience promise. All but two. All of them. But two. Are going to hear these laws, struggle through the wilderness, and only two will enter. Thirdly, God's preparing them for entrance and possession of the promised land so that when they get there, they will live set apart. They will be different from all the other surrounding peoples that are there. <coughs> There are laws in here concerning slavery, personal injury, sanctity of life, property rights, restitution for theft, personal holiness, social justice, in worship, through offerings, through festivals. What is the right sacrifice? What is the false sacrifice? On and on and on they go from Exodus 21, 22, 23, 24. Again, I'm not going to read them all to you. I'm not going to 
break them all down or make some sort of wild effort in, in a short amount of time to, to apply them all in your life because the mining out of this text for something specific for us to apply today is a little bit different. But there's some significant issues here. And I want to point out just a couple of them to you as we begin. So if you found Exodus chapter 21, I'm going to ask you to stand with us, please. And I'm just going to read a portion of this piece right here just so you can get a flavor of it, okay? Just so you can get a flavor of it. Exodus chapter 21. As we stand in honor of reading God's Word aloud together, it reads like this. Now these are the ordinances which you are to set before them. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years. But on the seventh, he shall go out as a free man without payment. If he comes alone, he shall go out alone. If he is the husband of a wife, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to her master, he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I, I will not go out as a free man, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. A man sells his daughter as a female slave. She is not to go free as the male slaves do. If she is displeasing in the eyes of her master who designated her for himself, he shall let her be redeemed. Are you blessed yet? Anyone? Anyone? No? Verse 12. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. But if he did not lie and wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then, then I will appoint you a place to which he may flee. If, however, a man acts presumptuously towards his neighbor so as to kill him craftily, you are to take him even from my altar that he may die. He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. He who curses his father or his mother shall what, graduates? Surely be put to death. If men have a quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, he does not die but remains in bed. If he gets up and walks around outside on his staff, then he who struck him shall go unpunished. He shall only pay for his loss of time. He shall take care of him until he is completely healed. If a man strikes his male or female slave, slave with a rod and he dies in his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken, for he is his property. Are you blessed yet? If men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise. For Bruce, thank you. You've probably had enough of this. <laughs> this is just half a chapter. No? This is just half a chapter. It gets really good as you go through this. Why in the world are these things in the Bible? It's further proof for you that there is a real God and there is a real people who's calling this real people to Himself. This is. The people that you're going to be for me, this is how you're going to reflect and honor me, and this is how you're going to live together. There's some significant issues just in the few verses that we read, aren't right there? Slavery, abortion, kidnapping, capital punishment. It's all here in these first few verses. God is beginning to lay out for them, you're going to be living in close quarters in an uncomfortable neighborhood for a long, long time. So how did Israel do with this? How did they make it through? Did they do well? Did they do poorly? Well, it's the same way that we do, really. Their initial response is acceptance. Their initial response is acceptance. I'm going to show you this. Flip over to Exodus 24, and we're going to hear some familiar words. So turn in your text to chapter 24. Look at verse 3. It says, Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. You heard this before? And then in verse 7, Then Moses took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. See, Moses could read it to his people. And what did they say? All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be what? We will obey. We will be obedient. They go a little bit step. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We're not only going to, we're going to obey, we're going to follow it. Sure thing, Lord. 
Sum me up. Sounds like a good idea. This is in month three of the wilderness experience. We've got 40 years left. So the first response is like us when we come to the Lord. Lord, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, however you want me to live, Lord, I am your man. Sign me up. I am ready to go. It's acceptance. But eventually, the natural inclination of man comes through, and that is to resist lordship. We talk about this often here in the church. Everybody wants a Savior. Everybody wants that man dying on a cross for our sins. But not everybody wants somebody telling us what to do. And Israel struggled mightily in their law keeping. And thereby in their relationship with God and with each other. It didn't take long to resist lordship, to resist the law, and to rebel against all of that. And Jesus Himself saw this firsthand and, and experienced this firsthand with the lawyers and the scribes and the Pharisees and the people of His day. As a matter of fact, I want to show you a couple of things in there. So I, I'm not intending to come back to Exodus, so if you'll flip all the way over into the New Testament, into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. What did Jesus see? What did Jesus experience? What did Jesus discern when He was here in His first-hand look at this? And I want to show you by the response of some questions of these so-called experts of the day, these rulers of the day. And when they got Jesus, they began to, to ask Him questions, to test Him, to test Him for knowledge, to test Him for wisdom, to test Him for discernment, what it may be. And so I want to see the responses of Jesus and what we're supposed to do with all this information from Israel's law in Exodus 21 through 24 and even in today. What does Jesus do with it? Look at verse 34 in chapter 22. It says, When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, means a, a scribe, a ruler that was an expert on God's law, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your what church? Your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? At this point in time, the Pharisees and these lawyers have subscribed 633 extra laws. That they're to follow. Not just the big 10, 633, and then there's punishment if you don't obey all of them when you're supposed to obey them and how you're supposed to obey them. So he asked them to test them, what's the greatest one? And Jesus responds with the law of Christ to love. The law of Christ is to love. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is giving Him your attention, your affection, your trust, your surrendered life. The law according to Christ is love. Now flip over two more books to the right and then Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. We're going to hear another question in Luke chapter 10. These lawyers, they've always got to be talking to them. Asking questions. Putting things to the test. In Luke chapter 10, another lawyer stood up and put him to the test in verse 25. Say, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The first lawyer, what's the great commandment? I know that there's a lot of laws, but what's the main one that i got to keep? The next one says, what must I do? What box do I need to check to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? In the law? <coughs> How does it read to you? The man said, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Now what? Do it. Do this and live. What is the greatest command in all of Scripture? To love God with all. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will inherit eternal life. Now, one more question is yet to be answered here in Luke chapter 18. Just three chapters over, if you'll follow that over there. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. We've heard this question before. We've heard this story before. Another ruler, another lawyer, uh, that we know 
them as the rich young ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And you know the commandments. You're a ruler. You're a lawyer. You're in the, you're in the church for goodness sake. You should know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father, your mother. What is Jesus saying here? He said, The law has been given to you. You should know better. You should know the law. The greatest commandment is to love. If you'll do this, then you will live. This is Israel's elite. This is Israel's elite after thousands of years still trying to discern how to live and please God. To the point that they're questioning this carpenter from Nazareth, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? Jesus' response, love God, love each other. Love God, love each other. And you'll do this by obeying God's word. So what do we learn from all this? We've got these laws that are hard to follow and understand. We've got uh, the law of Christ that's now being uh, heightened the law. But what do we do with this? Is there any application that we can pull from 21 through 24? I know we haven't read it all, but what, what are we supposed to do with this information? We need to realize this, that God's law is right and it's good. If you want to live rightly in the world, this is the guideline that you follow. You don't get to make it up as you go along. You don't get to try to figure out the societal norm and try to fit in with everyone else. This is God's law. It's not meant to be burdensome to you. Please fill that in your blank today. It's not meant to be burdensome to you, but liberating, but free. It's not meant to, to tether you to something that you don't enjoy, but to give you life. The only way His law becomes a burden to us is when we disobey. Right? Because the law shows us what is right and what is good, and then when we don't do it, then come consequences, then comes punishment, and usually accompanied by guilt and shame. So we learn about God and this the theology. This is that God's law is right and good. It's His way that's best, not my way. We learn from the prophets that His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And But what now points us to Christ in this is it's still the law. What points us to Christ? The law points us to Christ. Galatians 3 says that the law is a tutor for us. It explains how much we need God's law. Now, in the New Testament, there seems to be a stark contrast between the, the obeying of the law and then being freed from the law. Look at the negative picture that the law paints and fill in your blanks as we go along and we'll do this in rapid fashion. In 2 Corinthians, it says that the law kills. Alright? In Romans 3, the law cannot save. And it cannot justify. What good is it then? Well, okay, the law is going to bring wrath. The law is going to imprison us. And the law is a curse. The law says don't. But we do it anyway. So it imprisons us. It points out shortcomings in our sin. The law says do. And then we don't. That's how we still adhere to the necessity of the law. Paul is insisting in each of these categories as much as uh, this negative picture is what he painted, but yet the law is actually still grace to us. <coughs> the law doesn't save, it cannot save, it will not justify, but it does diagnose a serious problem, doesn't it? Because when the law says do this and we don't, it's beginning to reveal in us that there is a heart Problem. There is a heart problem. There is a brain problem. There is an issue within us that says, my pride, my way, my purposes, my will, my desire, my agenda is so much more important to me. The law is grace to us because it diagnoses the problem of the heart. The law makes us realize what great sinners we are so that we can understand what great Savior Christ is. And if there's anything that I can leave with this group on the front row today and with all of us, it's this self-realization for the day. The first is this. I'm a great sinner. Write it down. Draw an arrow to yourself. I am a great sinner. You practice all the time. You get good at what you practice, right? 
And we do it over and over and over again. So self-realization number one is I'm a great sinner. But praise God for self-realization number two today. What? Jesus is a great Savior. Amen, church. Amen. Jesus is a great Savior. In all our best human efforts, we cannot keep God's law perfectly. We need another to do this for us. Our only hope in this matter, this understanding, comes not from our law keeping and trying to keep up with, with all these individual laws, but in the law that Christ kept. The Old Testament laws are still vital for us. We look back and go, man, that's just for Israel. I'm going to turn the page and skip right over. Look at how they're to behave in proximity with each other. Look at how they're supposed to be set apart and to be different from all the other nations in the world and all the other peoples of the world. So they're still important to look at. They're still important to adhere to. We need to be prepared for something, though. We're not going to keep them perfectly. No one ever will. And they're going to reveal to us what a mess we've become. What a mess we've become. So what should our response be? I'll tell you this today. Our response should be this. Take God's law to heart. Not legalistically, as if you, you could be saved by them, but as a pattern of conduct in God's world to live a life pleasing to Him. I find it interesting that at the beginning of my preparation this week, on Monday, my devotional for Monday was on this very topic. And I'm going to close with this today. Never forget it says what God required. Never forget that what God required, you could not do. Christ did it for you. His grace is your hope. He's honest enough to say you and I tend to want to point to anything we can to prove that we are not lawbreakers, but we're law keepers. Look at how much I give to charity. Look at how hospitable I am. Look at the level of my theological knowledge. Look at how I share the gospel with others. Look at what a good marriage I have. Look how successful my business has become. Look at how I've resisted pornography and adultery. Look at the fact that I've homeschooled my children. Look at how I never curse or swear. Look at all the short-term mission trips that I've been on. Yet, the whole argument of the Bible is that if we were able to keep the law of perfection and consistency, Jesus would not have had to come. The sad reality is that alone, none of us is righteous. None of us measures up. None of us has any power whatsoever to keep the law so consistently as to achieve acceptance by a completely holy God. So it was essential that Jesus would come and live in a way that none of us could ever live. To die the death that we will all deserve to die and to rise, defeating sin and death. Hear this today, church. Hope is never to be found in your performance. Hope is never to be found in your performance. No matter what actions you are able to point to, sin is your infection. And without the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is also your demise. It is inescapable and morally debilitating, and it will lead to your death. So abandon hope in your own righteousness. Abandon the delusion that somehow you can measure up on your own. Run to the place where hope can be found and throw yourself again today on the grace of Jesus. He did what you could never do so that you would be welcomed in the arms of a righteous God. To be fully accepted even though in reality you are anything but righteous. How can God accept you and not compromise His own righteousness? He can do this because Christ's righteousness has been credited to your moral account. Now that is an amazing grace. You're going to break the law. Run to the grace giver. Abandon hope in your ability. Abandon hope in your agenda. Abandon hope in your nature. Abandon hope in your goals in life. Abandon hope in all of those things that could potentially bring joy or satisfaction or completion in you. Bo said it earlier today. Christ is the author and the perfecter, the completer, the finisher of your faith. I say along Jesus today as He spoke to the rich young man, do this and you will live. Obey God's Word you will live. Trust Him and Him alone. Do this and you will live. For all other pretenders, that are just looking at just getting by. Follow a few rules, show up to the church, 
pack a Bible around, say all the right things, show up to all the right places, you may find yourself one day far apart. You've never been in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never fallen on Him as your trust. You've never surrendered your life to Him. And then you pack the Bible around, but you've never really done what it says, right? James says, don't just hear it. Do it. Jesus says, don't just hear it. Act upon it. Obey. Obey. Follow me. Let's pray. Lord, may our aim today, may our whole mindset and our attitude today be to accept the fact that you are all around us. You are in our heart. You are in our mind. You are in our hands and our feet. Lord, you are all around us and the people and in the circumstances and the situations in life. But Lord, to know that you are that near and that you've drawn us that close and then to rebel against you, to be indifferent towards you, to find a way around you so that this life can be more pleasurable. That this life would bring me all the joy that I'll ever have. Thank you for what your word promises to us. Thank you for how your word disciplines us. How it reminds us. Lord, I ask that your word would come alive in us today. As we leave this place. That the law has been written on our heart. The law has been written in your word. Your revelation to us, how we see you, how we experience you, that you would be first. That you would be first above all other gods, above all other pretenders. That we would want you the most. Thank you for your instruction. Thank you for your spirit that leads and guides us. Thank you for the promise that you're always with us.